I'm proud of the business success. You know, certainly I've had, you know, I've had two billion dollar plus companies, I've had three IPOs. Certainly, from any scorecard, I've done great. But the thing I'm proudest of is the fact that I was able to do those things while staying married uh, to the same woman for 35 years, and having my kids grow up knowing me and best I can tell liking me, and getting out and backcountry skiing and mountain biking and kayaking and surfing. That is the thing that I'm proud of. Have you ever come across an idea for a business or an invention and thought, oh my God, this is amazing. And then you told people about it and they said, that's pretty stupid. That will never work. Well, my guest today had that very experience and guess what? His idea turned into a hundred billion dollar company and is here today to share all of his hard won lessons. Mark Randolph is a veteran Silicon Valley entrepreneur, advisor, and investor with a career spanning four decades. As co-founder and first CEO of Netflix, he laid the groundwork for a service that's grown to over 200 million subscribers and fundamentally altered how the world experiences media. Mark's founded or co-founded six other successful startups. He's mentored hundreds of early stage entrepreneurs and helped seed dozens of successful tech ventures. He's the host of the podcast, That Will Never Work, and the author of the international bestseller, That Will Never Work, The Birth of Netflix and the Amazing Life of an Idea. This book, like, honestly, I don't read that many business memoirs. This was fantastic. Like, such good <laughs> storytelling. I was talking to my partner. He's like, wait, did you finish Mark's book already? I'm like, oh, yeah, I'm done. Like, highlighted, underlined. So congratulations on that. Um, I know you said you wrote this book to puncture some of the myths that attach themselves to stories like yours and to show the amazing life of an idea from dream to concept to shared reality. So we're just going to dive in. First, you talk about this notion of distrusting epiphanies, that when they appear in origin stories, they're either oversimplified or just plain false, that the real story is a lot more complicated than that. So why is this truth so important for all entrepreneurs to understand? Well, f first of all, I, I'm, I'm glad you went through the book so quickly. I think it's kind of appropriate that a book about Netflix would be bingeable. I think that was kind of one of the those subtle things you're aiming for when you write a book. Yeah. No, but seriously... Um, that unfortunately, there is a tremendous amount of myths about entrepreneurship and about startups and about companies. And one of the big ones, as, um, as I do mention in the book, is the epiphany story, which is that belief that somehow these great ideas all of a sudden spring forth fully formed in some eureka moment. That, you know, it's, it's the moment that all becomes clear. Um, because those stories do resonate with us. You you know, there's there's the classic, what is it, Airbnb, where they can't make their rent. And, okay, we're going to get a, put an air mattress down in our spare bedroom and boom, there's Airbnb. Or, yeah. you know, Travis can't get a cab on New Year's Eve and boom, there's Uber. Or late fee in a movie and boom, there's Netflix. But the reason is it's not like that, that, that the patrimony of... Uh, an idea is really complicated. There's lots and lots of people involved, each contributing little bits. And there's huge dead ends, false starts along the way. And that's what I wanted to tell in the book, was that, that this is a complicated process that's fun, that's scary, that's um, interesting, that's not just, boom, we're finished. That's right. And knowing that truth, I also found it so reassuring because having the emotional truth of a narrative that is easy to tell in the media or easy to tell to investors or easy to tell to friends and family or even potential customers, it's like that's valid too. And so I loved being able to see both sides of that. You know, like when you're trying to get something off the ground and you don't know what the hell it is, but it starts sounding good and you've got a sound bite, it's like, yeah, it's okay to use it, but you don't want to fall into the notion. And I think I've seen this a lot with folks in my audience. I've certainly tortured myself with it uh, with different projects. I'm like, this should be going faster, right? Like I, this should be a little <laughs> bit easier. At least that's the voice in my head that sometimes comes up. Um, but I think both are true. Like, have you seen in some of your other companies or even as you're advising entrepreneurs that yes, 
the myth is there, right? It's going to take time, false starts. It's not going to happen necessarily in a, you know, angels kind of coming out of the clouds and oh kind of moment. But do you also advise entrepreneurs to kind of whittle down an origin story so that it is retellable, that it is shareable, that it is kind of iconic or legendary? Yeah, well, you may notice that I didn't call these origin for stories fake or right. disingenuous. That's right. Um, and when people take them literally, yes, of course, they go, oh, you know, you're lying. It didn't really happen that way. But what you learn, especially if you begin telling the story over and over again, is people really don't want to hear 356 pages of where this <laughs> idea came from. That's right. And, you know, their eyes glaze over. And so quickly you realize, no, they just need something quick and pithy, which is emotionally true, which yes. communicates what is the purpose of this? What were we trying to solve? What was our dream? Yeah. Um, and then you get on into the reality of, of what's going on. So I certainly, it's all the time. You need to have a narrative. You need to have some way of expressing what your vision is because that's what is the magnetic force field that aligns everyone who's working with you, that they're all pointing in the same direction, even if they're not necessarily being able to see which direction you're going. And that comes from having this clear narrative. And if the narrative you're telling the world is the exact same narrative you're telling your own team and they're telling yourself, well, that's the sign of a really, really good one. So you shared that Silicon Valley brainstorming sessions often begin with someone saying, there are no bad ideas, but you've always disagreed. There are bad ideas, but you just don't know an idea is bad until you've tried it. And I, I love that because, you know, in our company, we're constantly brainstorming. And when I call it sp throwing spaghetti at the wall because I'm Italian and I like spaghetti. Um, <laughs> and it's like you kind of do have to go through all the ones. So, you know, Netflix was your fifth company. After Business 4, you were coming up with a ton of bad ideas, so to speak, right? Like there was baseball bats, surfboards, personalized yeah. shampoo, even dog food. And when you eventually stumbled upon videotapes and then eventually DVDs, your mom even said, right, that'll never work. So I, I want to know if you have any advice for how to discern if our big idea is really kind of a bad and sucky idea, or maybe it's just not there yet. Well, I can shortcut the process entirely for you and for everyone who's listening, which is, it's a bad idea. I mean, I know it's, I haven't even, you know, wait a minute, I'll put on the, all right, oh yeah, yeah, it's a bad idea. And the reason I'm so, I'm so confident that it's a bad idea is because every idea is a bad idea. I mean, as you mentioned, you know, every brainstorming session, no such thing as a bad idea. Well, BS, they're all yeah. bad ideas. But that's a critically important thing to understand because you cannot hold on to this precious gem, this golden child of an idea, and keep it in your head where it's safe and warm and build it all up only to collide it at some point in the future and realize then it's a bad idea. The, the truth that comes from realizing that all ideas are bad ideas, that the only way to figure out what's wrong with it, the only way to get that little insight that leads you to your next idea... The only way to eventually shift and pivot and change to get to a company that actually works, or forget the company, to get to something that actually works is starting, is taking that bad idea and colliding it with reality. And, you know, I've been doing this for 40 years, and this thing that I've learned is that I don't care about your ideas because I'm not looking for how good your idea is. What really separates a great entrepreneur is their ability to be creative enough to come up with a quick, cheap, and easy way to test it. Yes. That's Amen. what us entrepreneurs does really well. That's right. This is like, a, it's a Thursday when we're recording this. It'll probably be a Tuesday when it comes out, but I'm saying amen because we are in business church right now. And I know you also wrote too, I'm going to say this. I'm going to take say hallelujah. Here. Hallelujah. We are in the hallelujah zone. In fact, you know what? I, are you drinking tea or coffee? You're like making me want mine. I can't tip it up. It's a cappuccino that I make oh. every morning down in my, uh, mm. with my ridiculously over the top espresso machine. I, I love that. And uh, I often say, like, as a writer, I have um, – this is basically my gift when I'm writing. It's just – Channeling caffeine into words. That's basically <laughs> all I do. And I have it's a, it's a right? new form it's, of yeah. alchemy, isn't it? It's it like, is. It's a form of that. alchemy. I'm like tapping into, <laughs> you know, the nectar of the gods and just channeling its wisdom <laughs> onto a page. This one so I've I got have, a different thing different yeah. thing going here, Marie, which is that basically I, my 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 motto is why do something when you can overdo something? <laughs> 
And so, <laughs> this is why I knew we were kindred spirits, and I know our our mutual friend uh, Heidi. She's like, you guys got to know each other. You guys, I was like, yeah, I got a feeling about this. But it was good. I, it, that's been the story of my life. It's like too much, Marie. Too much. I'm like, what are you talking about? This this is how you, I came out. It's always too much. Exactly. Um, <laughs> So, okay, moving on. Follow up that many entrepreneurs have like this particular question. How do I know when to give up on an idea? So we've already established the idea is probably sucky. It's crappy. It sucks. But let's say they've been going, they've been pivoting, they've been trying, they've been testing, they've been, you know, kind of making these alterations and these tweaks. And they're thinking to themselves, should I just accept the sunk costs? You know what I mean? And say, okay, this one was really a not working thing. I'm not going to give up totally, but maybe just this idea. What's your perspective there? So you phrased it in an interesting way, which is when do I know when to give up on an idea? And I like that you phrased it that way because it allows me to answer it really easily, which is as soon as you realize it's not a good idea, mm-hmm. which that you do not hang on to an idea. This big rule is do not fall in love with your idea. Fall in love with the problem. That's a different thing altogether because the idea, despite the fact that you think it is going to grow up to be a Heisman Trophy winner or a Nobel Prize winner, the ideas may end up doing crack behind the 7-Eleven and you just don't know that until you try it. So the trick here is give up on that. But don't give up on the problem because the problem will get richer, more nuanced. You'll understand it better. You'll understand the customer and what they really need because each of these failed ideas is making the problem closer to being solved. Yes. But I don't want to pounce on words as a way to weasel out of answering the hard question. And what you're really saying is, when do I know when to give up? Mm. And I don't know because... I'm not wired that way, and most entrepreneurs aren't wired that way. We give up when someone forces us to give up, when we run out of money, we run out of time, when it's so completely self-evident this is not going anywhere and something else has my attention. Mm. Um, It's more shifting tracks than it is giving up. And I, I just fundamentally believe that as long as it intrigues you, you keep going with it. Um, And eventually, you figure it out. But this ties into something deeper, and I won't go too too much time on it here, but it depends on what you're looking for. And I think we started off this entire segment about talking about um, a lot of the myths surrounding entrepreneurship. And I think a lot of people get into this because they believe, oh, I'm going to be rich or I'm going to be famous. And if those are the things you're looking for, you may as well give up now because it's extremely unlikely those things will happen. If you're saying, I just love this problem solving. I love doing something different every day. I love working with interesting people and solving really hard puzzles. Then this whole idea of failure and success are different because as long as you're coming in every day and getting to work on that problem, well, you're being successful. That's right. And by the way, you know, my show, my rules, as long as you got time, I got time. So we can go as long as we want. We can go as deep as we want. I was really, really psyched for this one. And I want to stay here for a moment because I actually want to talk about something I read on your blog. And it was the thing, Mark, that made me reach out to our mutual friend, Heidi. And I was like, I got to have Mark on the show. Like now I want to talk about this. So you wrote this very short blog and it was very powerful. And I shared it with my team. Um, about when you visited a friend in Paris and Hmm. you were talking with her French husband who has a small import business selling gloves from Switzerland to high-end retail stores. And you had all kinds of advice, right, for all the things that he could do potentially to grow his business. And he was like, not having the advice from Mark Randolph. He was like, no, sir. And um, he actually said to you, stop. Why would I do any of the things that you're suggesting? So I'm wondering if you could um, tell us more about that story, why your friend's husband was like, "Uh uh-uh, and and the point of that blog that you really wanted to share. Yeah, it, it was kind of a revelatory moment because I'm so used to talking business and getting all excited about all the different ways you can grow and try and expand. And this a friend of my, uh, my husband and my friend was having none of it, having this puzzled look, which I assumed was a language barrier. 
you know, so I slowed down and used more hand gestures. And finally, I could tell, you know, he was starting to laugh because his comment was, as you said, why would I want to do any of that? He goes, I've got a great life. We have an apartment in Paris. We have a small place in the south of France. I take off five weeks every summer. I bridge my weekends many other times during the year. Why do I want to keep pursuing more and more and more at the expense of this wonderful balance of life um, that I have? And it was just a really interesting reminder that balance is probably more important, at least for me, than economic success. I mean, there's always more, but at some point you say, this is, what I am now is pretty darn good. And then the struggle becomes, how do you maintain that? And I really kind of was, this is a long time ago, but it really opened my eyes that you could think about this world very, very differently. Yeah. And I'll tell you, I had so many times, I've been in business for about 20 years now, and I remember maybe it was around like the 12 year mark or so. And I was invited to this event and it was at, gosh, I think it might've been at either Fortune Magazine or Forbes or something. This is, I don't remember the exact one. Anywho, cut to the fact. There was a bunch of us being introduced around the table and it was like, Oh, Marie Forleo, like she's just a lifestyle entrepreneur. And Mark, I will tell you, like it felt like it was like a poo-pooing, you know what I mean? Of the then the person that was leading this particular kind of event, he was an employee of the magazine. And I remember thinking to myself, and this is Jersey Marie coming out at the time. So just a little bit revealing <laughs> of my alter ego. I was like, who the hell is this clown? Like from a financial perspective, I can guarantee I'm running circles around you. But I remember feeling like offended. I felt shame. I felt like I wasn't a real entrepreneur because I wasn't going out necessarily raising venture capital or, you know, wanting to grow at these hyper speeds. And it was a real experience for me to go like, but I don't want venture capital. Like the whole reason I got into running my own business is because I'm a human being who values freedom more than anything. And I love making a difference to people, but I also love doing it in my own way. And I have a very unique, quirky kind of vision for how I want that to come to life. So I just wanted to share that because for you, and I I, I so appreciate and respect not only everything that you've built, but how much you love solving problems and how much you love supporting entrepreneurs and making their ideas a reality. And I just loved this blog because it was another underscore of there's many different ways to play this entrepreneurial game, well, right? Can I, not, can I talk a bit more about please. balance then? Yes, please. Only because, you know, you know when I was probably in my, uh, my late 20s, um, uh, and I was, I was living with my girlfriend at the time and I was working like crazy you know, working weekends, working nights, not because I had a slave driver a boss, because I loved what I was doing, deeply passionate, couldn't wait to get to the office every day. But I had this revelation that I was working all the time and my girlfriend um, was basically getting the leftovers. And it dawned on me, or maybe it dawned on me when she began hitting me about the head and shoulders with a stick, that this was not the basis for a sustainable relationship. And it kind of marked this moment where I said, if I want to have some balance in my life, I have to make, I have to prioritize that. And for me, that balance has been tricky because there's actually a third leg to that stool, which is that these, the personal, the things that makes me a whole as a person that really brings me the great joy is being outdoors. Uh, and I don't mean walks around the park. I mean going out and mountain biking or backcountry skiing or canoeing a wilderness river in Alaska. I mean, these are not the types of events that you can fit in between a noon call and a two o'clock meeting. Yep. And so if I was going to make all this happen, be an entrepreneur, which is what I love doing, but maintain this relationship with my best friend and be able to feed that part of my soul that needed the outdoors... I was going to have to make that the highest priority. How do you do that? How do you fit all those three things in, together? And I have to say, that is that has been the focus of my life, much more so than I'm going to create the disrupt the streaming world or I'm going to make big returns for shareholders. It's not. It's 
can I do this thing I love, which is starting and building companies at the same time that I can have a family and that I can get outside and enjoy uh, the outdoors? You know, and looking back, I'm proud of the business success. You know, certainly I've had, you know, I've had $2 billion plus uh, companies, I've had three IPOs, certainly from any scorecard I've done great. But the thing I'm proudest of is the fact that I was able to do those things while staying married uh, to the same woman for 35 years and having my kids grow up knowing me and best I can tell liking me and getting out and backcountry skiing and mountain biking and kayaking and surfing. That is the thing that I'm proud of. And do you want to say anything? Because I can hear my audience after, again, doing this so long. I hear questions in advance. <laughs> so I'm going to serve them up to you in a second. They're going to be like, Mark, tell us the secret. Tell us, Mark. Is there anything that you want to say about whether it is mistakes that you've made in the past in the quest to have that integration or anything that you've discovered that's worked for you that you're like, wow, this is something that has consistently enabled me to feed those three areas, even though I'm sure the ratios always change, it's always going to be a dance, different seasons of life. Anything you want to say about the how or the tactics? Sure. I mean, the, 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 the underlying the fundamental principle is if you don't know what you want, uh, the odds are very slim you're going to get it. Um, and the first part is deciding that this truly is the most important thing to you. And not paying lip service to it, not saying, boy, it'd be great if I spent, but saying, no, I'm, well, in my case, I'm 30 years old. Uh, I have a bunch of years to do this. This is important to me. And then actively doing it. And if you think it's easy, I can tell you it's really, really hard. I've worked really, really hard at it. And I'm, like I said, that's been the top objective of my life for the most part is balancing those three things. But let me give you an example. And this is kind of, I've talked about this before, but when we were starting um, Netflix, before I started Netflix, I had this principle that I said, okay, we're having one night a week at least where I'm going to leave the office at five. We're not going to have phones. Uh, we're going to get a sitter for the kids and we're going to go out and have a night for the two of us. Um, and if you, you listen, you, you've you've run a startup before. You know that things don't nice tie up nice and neat at five p.m. But I was adamant. I said, if there is going to be a crisis, we are going to wrap it up by five. Um, you need to talk to me. Fine, we're going to talk on the way to the car. But this amazing thing happens after you do this for a few months. It's like I don't know how it could be, but. The crises stop happening after 5 o'clock yes. p.m. on Tuesdays. How could this be? And more importantly, I'm a big believer in culture and how important culture is to a company. And culture is not what you say, it's what you do. And I could talk till I was blue in the face about how important balance is and we need to make sure we have another life besides our work life. But nothing says that more strongly than watching the boss walk out of there at 5 o'clock p.m. every Tuesday. Um, and that was perhaps even the more powerful thing is because then you begin seeing other people carving these times out of their life. That's right. And 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 date night is easy. Imagine I'm going to go up and kayak the Noatak River in, uh, in Alaska, which is, you know, 10 days to two weeks. Carving that time out when you're running a company. Now, there's an advanced maneuver. Did you, uh, did Reed ever say to you, like, what are you doing, Mark? Like, you need to be here, X, Y, and Z. Or did you guys just have an understanding that he knew who you were and you all knew each other from the previous company and from always working together? Like, was that ever it's, a friction point? It's deeper than that, Maria. Yeah. This, you've touched on a key aspect of a culture I've always had in companies that I've been part of and certainly permeated Netflix. And it's that thing they call freedom and responsibility, which is, I don't care where you are, when you are, whether you're in the office or not, that's not what you're here for. But there are certain things that you're responsible for, which I expect you to get, get done. Hey, it's me. So real quick, if you want to learn to start and grow your dream business, but you literally got no money to do it, you are going to love my free guide. It's called 322 free tools and resources to start your business especially if you got no money. So you can go download it now at 322freetools.com. That's 322freetools.com. 
And since you said I have all the time in the world, I'll tell a quick story about that. Um, and this is when I was, I, I was, you know, running company and, and one of my engineering managers, the person who is supervising the programmers, comes in and goes, Mark, I've got great news. And I go, what? He goes, I'm in love. And for engineers, of course, that is uh, great news. But uh, he goes, but, and I go, okay, there's a but. And he goes, yeah, she lives in San Diego. And, you know, he's up here in the San Francisco Bay Area. And I go, okay. And he goes, so I've got a proposal. What I'd like to do is leave work, you know, at four or five on Thursday, and I'll fly down to San Diego, and I'll work from there on Friday, spend the weekend, I'll work from there on Monday, come home Monday night, be in the office Tuesday morning. He goes, what do you think? And I go, well, let me parse this out. So if you're asking me if it's okay for you to go down and spend, you know, four days a week in San Diego and three days a year, fine, I don't care. You can, you can work on the moon for all I care. That's not what's important. But if you're asking me if I'm willing to lower my expectations of you to change the things I expect you to get accomplished, well, that's easy because the answer to that is no. Um, and so if you think you can, you're an engineering manager, people report to you. If you think you can do an effective job not being here two days out of the five days of the week, well, all power to you. You're a better man than I do. Um, but I'm leaving it to you. I'm giving you the responsibility to solve this problem any way you want. Um, and that's the relationship that Reed and I had. That's the relationship we have with everyone in the company, which is you. It's not if you just say, "Hey, I'm going on vacation," it's on you. That doesn't yep. work. Yep. But if you, before I go, I know what I have to get done. I pick the time of the year when I can do it. I make sure I've got people who can back me up. Um, and then that's fine. Uh, it, that's the difference. It's 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 tr it's deep, deep trust, but it's trust based on expectations of responsibility, coupled with the freedom to do the job however you think is the most effective way to do it. One of the things that I love that you shared was the process of how y'all named Netflix. Um, <laughs> I know you guys, you had the office, you had an idea, but you didn't have a name. And walking through the whiteboard with all the different possibilities, and I love that you shared this pro tip that one or two syllable names often do best, especially when the emphasis is on the first syllable. And I think the beta name you chose was Kibble, and you shared, and I didn't know this, Amazon was originally Kadabra. Twitter started off as status. I've seen so many entrepreneurs, Mark, especially again, real newbies like, what is the name? It's got to be perfect. If I don't have the perfect name, I can't start the business. And I call those things creative cul-de-sacs. It's like you're in a little <laughs> car and you're driving around, you're driving around, doo -doo 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 -doo, and I'm like, stop, get out, pick something. So uh, what do you say to folks whether it's a name of the company or anything else that they're trying to get perfect, what would you say to them when they get stuck there? Well, that, you know, it's funny. I, you, you and our kindred spirits. That's I, I'm going to borrow the creative cul-de-sac. I just call it circular problems. Yeah. Where you, you go, okay, this looks good, but it's got this problem. All right, let's try this because that solves this problem, but it creates a new one. And you do that three times, and all of a sudden you're back where you started. Yes. And the key is to recognize when you're in the creative cul-de-sac. You get into them, of course, but it's to recognize when you're there. And in many ways, it frees you up because now you have permission to choose a suboptimal solution. You don't need it to be perfect. Yes. And I, boy, do I have respect for people who are trying to name a company these days. It was hard enough back in 1997. You know, now I think I saw it described picking a company name is like a drunk cat playing Scrabble. <laughs> You know, it's like, you know, lots of X's and Z's and blank letters and weird punctuation. It's tough because you do. You need to have something which hopefully is evocative, right. uh, makes sense, is easy to spell, doesn't mean something obscene in Lithuanian. You can get a domain name for it. You can get a trademark. You can get the Twitter handle. Fit. Oh, my God. It's impossible. Impossible. And so you're right, you have to settle. And, you know, our process was we had these two columns. One was names that were evocative of movies. One was evocative of the internet, because that's what we were combining at that time. And we just went through the list. And a lot of them were taken. A lot of them didn't work. And no one, no one liked Netflix. I mean, to start, this is back in the, you know, the 90s. 
uh, their a porno was called a skin flick or skin <laughs> flicks. Yes. So having the flicks name was bad and that X at the end didn't do us uh, much good either. But like you said, you're in the creative cul-de-sac and you go, there is no good answer. So pick. Yes. And, and Netflix that sounded tip, a little porny, but you know, it, uh, it worked. It worked. And I'll tell you, well, I'm going to get a little porny in the, in the most creative way right now. My, uh, <laughs> a friend of mine and I who write together, we actually, we have a writing program teaching people. And I know as an ad guy, you'll appreciate this. I mean, writing copy as a business owner, especially in today's world, it, for me, it's one of the skills that I think anyone can learn and anyone can get better at. And I'm always trying to get better at it. And one of the tools that we teach people is actually to have word orgies when you're trying to come up with a name for something. It's just <laughs> like you make those lists and we show people how we do it. And it's so fun and it's so hilarious. And it's so, but it, that gets your creativity opened up and allows you to be silly and goofy and throw things at it that you would never even, and like the most ridiculous or offensive or whatever, but just to stop that editing process. And usually in the midst of that, something works. You go for enough volume, you go for enough silliness. And so, you know, that might help as you're advising. You say, you know what? I didn't come up with this. So no one can get offended or get mad at you. You can say, my friend Marie Forleo said, you might want to have a word orgy on paper and just let them figure it out. <laughs> I'm learning so much from you. This is awesome. <laughs> <laughs> So I want to go back to team for a moment because I had a cheer out loud moment on my couch when I was reading this. You shared about being wary of title inflation. You said, although it seems like it costs you nothing to give, it's actually far more expensive than it seems since it causes a cascading series of over promotions. I got to share this because this is just me having a moment. Anytime we are considering a hire, if someone walks in our virtual doors and they are hyper-focused on their title or they keep asking like, okay, I got to know the growth path. And we're like, you don't even have the job yet. I literally, I won't hire them. I'm like, that is a problem. I don't want to have. <laughs> I can love you as a human being. Bless you. I want the best for you, but is not going to be a part of this bus. Um, has your perspective on this changed over the years as you've been advising startups or do you, do you still see that one as, as being pretty solid? Oh, no, I think it's completely valid. Only because I see the problems that it creates later on. And problems of ego um, are really, really hard to solve. They make problems of financing and problems of product market fit look like nothing. And this classic case, and, and the other part is that in a startup, there is almost this planned obsolescence which is that the people who are there on day one have a very specific skill set, which is that they are jack of all trades, that they're good at lots of things, but not amazingly good at any one particular thing. They're people who have professional ADHD, where they're very, very comfortable working like crazy on one thing, then shifting gears, doing something else, coming into the office and hearing this thing we've been working on for two weeks, we're stopping, we're going somewhere else and they get excited about that rather than disappointed. It's a very specific skill set. But if you are lucky enough to find that product market fit, to get the repeatable, scalable model we're all looking for, the skills for repeating and scaling are different. And that leads to this very, very difficult conversation, which is I need to hire someone above you. And that's hard enough as it is. But associating that and saying, and we're knocking you down from being senior vice president of worldwide marketing when you're a 10 person organization and making you director, it just helps to say, listen, at the beginning, we're not going to have fancy titles. Uh, we're going to have something which gives the outside world some sense of what we do. And listen, if you need to represent yourself to American Airlines, that you're the senior vice president of worldwide marketing, fine. But just that's not really your title. Uh, it's hard because as I mentioned in the book, it's easy to do that, and especially when someone says, it's like union negotiation. If, uh, I'll get myself in trouble here. It's so much easier to say, we'll give you a bigger pension than it is to say, we'll pay you more today. It's okay. easier to say, we'll give you three more holidays than we'll pay you more today. And as a yeah. result, you build up this tremendous overhanging stack of expectations, which are yep. almost impossible to fulfill. 
Oof, I love that you hit on that. Okay, now I need to get to like literally the place where if I was doing cartwheels before, this was like backflips and back handsprings and, you know, throwing daisies at your book and unicorns were shooting out of my eyeballs. So the analogy about your streamlining process, you call it scraping the barnacles off the hull. I call it simplify to amplify. It changes my life every day, every month, every quarter. To set you up, you wrote, in the wake of the blockbuster fiasco and the crash of the dot-com market, we took time to self-assess, then mercilessly pruned back all the programs, tests, additions, and enhancements that weren't contributing anymore. You're right. Most of the time, deciding what not to do is harder than deciding what to do. Talk about this process because I'm, you are preaching like I'm like woo Sunday. I talk about this all the time, trying to get people to simplify because not only is it some of the secret I think to our sanity, but it's been I've experienced massive growth, revenue, profit, impact, everything when we had the courage to slash like a million dollars here of revenue, a million dollars here, and so I just I'm gonna stop saying I want you to say it because <laughs> it's so good. Yeah, the, the, one of the superpowers of um, a startup is focus, is basically taking every single person in the company and having them focused on putting their, their, all their force to bear on a single point. Uh, startups are so hard. The nature conspires against them and throws everything they have. And if you're not putting all of your effort into a very, very focused point, you're not going to break through. And what, but the same time, uh, startups all about experimentation. You're trying hundreds of things, different customer approaches, different price points, different features, all sorts of stuff. And those two are antithetical to each other. And it requires, and what you realize is that even though this little test you did, this little extra price point you threw in seems insignificant, that it's cumulative. It's why I we called it scraping the barnacles off the hull because one individual barnacle is not going to slow a boat down. But once you have 10,000 of them on there, it's extremely material. And so we would go in and say, we're going to stop doing things. And believe me, there are voices which are shouting against that. Like for example, you are doing a 1995 per month program and you test 1495. Or you test if they're going to get extra feature. And that test fails, but now you've got a couple hundred people who are on that price and every single other person's on a different price. You don't recognize the cognitive load that goes into always acknowledging that. You're talking about a new feature and you go, oh, but we also have to make sure it works with the people who are at the lower price or the people who are getting an extra disc or whatever the thing you were testing was. And quickly you realize, I can't obsess about not upsetting these hundred people. I have to obsess about getting it right for the next hundred thousand people. Mm -hmm. And that is the trade-off you have to make all the time. If you are if you are Boeing and you have basically 60 customers in the world, well, it's different. You can't afford to lose one of them. But most companies, it's not like that. They have more to come and your obligation is to get it right for the future not to protect um, the past. Yeah, and I feel like um, I love that you said that because you know we do hear and people again, especially for new entrepreneurs, which are many of the folks in my audience, and frankly, even for all of us, it's like as people who are highly creative. I know myself; I'm a lifelong learner, always looking to to grow and expand and challenge myself. You hear one message one day, and then you're like, "Wait a minute, what the heck's going on?" Um, and I, I think that is so important because look, it's like. The testing is valuable, but especially in a digital first kind of business, which are many of our people, you can test all day long. You can have a million landing pages up. And like you said, you can have all these kind of offers and all this digital product stream clutter that not only the cognitive load, but looking at it from a programming perspective, a CX customer experience perspective, like all of that, it just, it can crash. Um, I want to also talk about the Canada principle because I think this is just, again, another great analogy. Can you explain what the Canada principle is? Because I think this is perfect, especially when shiny objects come into play or you hear from the person at dinner, like I've heard so many times, Mark, Marie, you're leaving X amount of money on the table. You should be doing this. You should be doing that. And I'm like, no. <laughs> <laughs> 
Yes, I am, but on purpose. <laughs> yeah, it's it, it's re- it's very true. And and the, the the intro here, of course, is that you know the Netflix now is very different than the one it was back when we started. Because sure. back then, it was a DVD by mail company. If you wanted a movie, we didn't stream it. We mailed it to you on a DVD in a little red envelope. And also, we were U.S. only. So for many years, that was the case. But for every single one of those many years, there was almost invariably someone to come up to me and go, Mark, you're, you're leaving money on the table. You should be going into Canada. Uh, it's easy. And it's a quick 10% bump in your revenues because market size is about one-tenth the United States. Uh, and at first you go, oh, that's kind of interesting. But what you realize is that what seems like low-hanging fruit rarely is. That in fact, well, in Canada, they actually use a different currency. And confusingly enough, it's called the dollar. And they speak a second language in Canada. In fact, it is mandated that you use that second language in certain parts of Canada. And there's DVD title issues. And some of these movies have different names in Canada than they do here. And the list goes on and on and on. But the fundamental truth, and what we call the Canada principle, was that the effort required to get that additional 10% of revenue by going to Canada, taking that same focus and attention and applying it to our core business would grow it infinitely more than 10%. Mm. And it was this discipline to say, don't get distracted. Keep on getting your core offering right. Keep focusing. You will know when the right time it is to go into Canada, to go to the UK, to add on this, to try that. But for the most part, stick to your knitting. We have to talk about the losing faith in you PowerPoint. (laughs) Because I think as creatives, right, we often have a hard time seeing the situation from outside of ourselves. I mean, that's human. That's normal. And oftentimes, we're part of the problem that we're trying to solve. Um, When I was reading that part of the book, which I'll I'll let you explain um, exactly what that means, but uh, it was, I felt it. I felt it in my gut. I felt it in my heart. I just thought you did such a great job of sharing not only what that experience was like and how emotional it was, but also the clarity that came from it. Yeah, I mentioned earlier about how it's a fundamental truth of startups that eventually you're going to outgrow some of your key employees. And that's going to be a very difficult moment of sitting them down and explaining to them that the skills that were phenomenal at the beginning are no longer the skills we need now. And it would be unfair to not subject yourself to that same um, examining. And in my case, uh, this was not long into the company. And uh, I was working late and uh, Reed Hastings, who was my co-founder, but was not working full-time at the company. He was my chair. He was uh, working in the Valley and something else. Popped his head in the office on his way home from work and said, listen, Mark, we need the talk. And as you know, as everyone knows, that's usually not, uh, doesn't lead to good news. And in fact, it wasn't. And he had a his lap, laptop there and he opened it up and began basically walking me through this slideshow, which in a nutshell was saying, I'm losing confidence in you. I'm not sure about your judgment. I'm concerned about this. And and I, I said, whoa, whoa, Reed, I am not going to sit here while you pitch me on while I suck. Uh, but and he goes, no, 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 that's, that's not it at all. And what he was really saying was, yes, he was having issues with my judgment. He was worried that I would scale. He's basically saying, Listen, there's smoke at the small size, but we have to execute flawlessly, and I'm worried there'll be fire later. But what he was proposing was that he come to join Netflix full-time and that we run the company together. And he left, and I sat quietly at my desk for, seems like, hours, then went home, and my wife and I had a bottle of wine on the porch, and I really had to think about what this meant. And but as I mentioned, you know, Reed and I had this relationship founded on complete honesty. So I knew there was no ulterior motive that I had to take very seriously what he was saying. But the thing is, I had this dream, of course, that I would be the CEO of this big successful company. But it made me confront that it was actually two different dreams. There was the dream, of course, of me being the CEO but also the dream of having this big successful company. 
and that maybe they weren't the same. And more importantly, the successful company dream wasn't just my dream anymore. It was my investors, it was my employees, it was my customers. And it was hard to argue that in fact, it would be a stronger company if Reed joined the company full time and we did it together. Uh, and I'm not saying that I walked off into the office the next morning bright and cheery and all ready to, it was hard because ego, as much as you don't want it to be there, it's hard to dispense with that. But I did come around to it and accept it and embrace it. And in many ways, those next handful of years while we were running the company together were the renaissance at Netflix. It's where we came up with so many of the key innovations that led to our success. It's where we cemented the culture. Um, and oh my gosh, look at where Reed has taken the company uh, since I've left. Uh, it was clearly best decision I think I ever made at Netflix was being comfortable recognizing that I'm not the best person uh, to lead this company into the future. You shared in the book that the finished product of Netflix wasn't your dream, that your dream was the process of making Netflix. Let's talk now a little bit about, from your perspective, how we might know when to stop pursuing an idea that maybe is not coming to life, or, or, or even more interestingly, when it might be time to walk away fully from, from something that's worked. I'm the wrong person to ask. I just don't know when to walk away. And it's not because I keep banging my head against the wall in some obstinate, ridiculous way. Mm -hmm. It's that I've never been motivated by the trappings of success. I hate to use that word. I never started any of the companies I've started for the money. Mm -hmm. um, I never thought about that. You know, I, I, now I've got seven. And if if you would ask me on day one, which would be successful, which would be a failure, I never could have told you. Yeah. I wasn't trying to handicap it that way. I did all of them because I was intrigued about solving a really interesting problem. And in Netflix case, it was, you know, is there a better way to do video rental using uh, the internet? And that didn't need to be the company. I never a million years, I swear, never imagined that it would go the way it went. But that wasn't the point. The point was every day I got to come to work and sit around that table with some fantastically talented, clever, funny people and work on solving these really interesting problems. And why would I want to give up on that, even if it's not making huge amounts of progress? And more importantly, when I look back, listen, it took a long time. Netflix is 24 years old. There was a plenty of times when we felt we weren't going to make it. We were almost out of business, when things were very, very dark. But when I look back now, those are the ones that I remember. Those are the ones that were the best. That was the most exciting. We were all challenged. So looking for some, it's not working as the trigger to give up, doesn't resonate with me. Mm -hmm. Once I start getting that thrill of this problem is not interesting anymore, uh, maybe. I want to start landing our conversation plane with uh, William Goldman's famous words, nobody knows anything. You write, nobody knows anything isn't an indictment, it's a reminder, an encouragement. Because if nobody knows anything, then you have to trust yourself. You have to test yourself and you have to be willing to fail. I'm wondering if you have anything more that you want to say on that as we wrap up our fun time together today. Yeah, you know, William Goldman wrote that. He was talking about Hollywood, you know, and about how no one knows how a movie's going to do until after it's done it. You can have the 200 million budget failure and the $35,000 Blair Witch Project, which makes $200 million. Yes. The point is, no one knows anything in Hollywood, but it is true any place people are trying new ideas that no matter how many times people tell you that will never work. And, and that's why I told the, I call the book that will never work. I call the podcast that will never work because it's this reminder to me that that's what everyone's going to tell you, but you can't take that as gospel because truly, as William Goldman reminds us, nobody knows anything. But the <laughs> only way to know if it's a good idea or a bad idea is to try it. 
and that the fundamental skill of all the things we've talked about today, Marie, the most important skill you can have as an entrepreneur is this predisposition to action, which is I'm just going to try it. Less thinking, more doing. That if you're not willing to take that step down the path because you can't see around the corner, that you want to study the problem and get up on a rock and can I... Well, by the time you finally get up your courage with the confidence that, oh yeah, there's something fun around the rock, you're going to get there and there's a hundred people there. You've got to take that first step and without the first step, you'll never, ever uh, do it. Mark, you're awesome. I'm hoping we can have some <laughs> cappuccino or coffee together uh, at some point soon. And uh, I want to tell you, I really, really, I think I mentioned this earlier, but if not, I want to make sure I say it, is your infectious enthusiasm for solving problems. Um, I caught it and I loved it. And I really, it was like, yes, like what an incredible frame and mindset to adopt and I, I found myself um, looking at it again yesterday, and I was like, yep, that's one I'm going to mark in my heart to remember. Uh, so thank you for that. And thank you for this incredible book and your spirit and your drive and your support of all entrepreneurs everywhere. It's, it, it's really been a pleasure. It's truly my pleasure as well. And thank you for, uh, thank you for the time today. Hey, if you've been waiting for the perfect moment to start or grow your business, guess what? There ain't no such thing. You need to click on the video right here next to me, and you're going to learn how the world's most successful entrepreneurs get unstuck and get started. Click and watch it now.